Hey guys, uh, John here. I uh, wanted to make a video about, um, well, my main goal was to make a video about flying today and getting back up in the pattern and flying around, uh, which I might still do. Uh, winds were reported at eight, crosswind of eight knots, and it's definitely more than that, so it's just not accurate. Um, not that that's a problem, but seeing as though I'm kind of in the phase of, uh, you know, Going, making sure the engine still runs good and all that stuff. I just don't know if I want to deal with that. So I don't get to get down to the airport very often. And uh, it sucks because I live so far away from where my airplane is. But uh, anyways, so I'm not going to let this day go to waste. I want to talk about something. And that is Challenger aircraft ownership. Um, there's a lot of debate out there about, uh, about the Challenger and owning the Challenger. Um, I see it all the time. I I watch the uh, the social media stuff, and there is a lot to Challenger. Um, I'm and for the record, I'm not coming into this as an expert. I I have recently just bought this airplane, and I'm learning, um, and I have a lot to learn. I found especially after my engine out. Um, but uh, to give you a quick background on me, because there's a lot of people again in social media, people just assume and they're just kind of keyboard warriors, but. Uh, um, as an infant, I grew up in an airplane. Uh, we had a 172. My dad's a pilot. My stepmom's a pilot. Um, we flew, I mean, from North Dakota to everywhere when I was little. And as I got older, uh, my dad started to do more experimental stuff. So all the or, or ultralight stuff back then. Um, so then we had, you know, Quicksilvers and um, you know things like that. And uh, my dad and his friend Sherman started a company called Freebird. Uh, which is still around today, um, oddly enough. Um, I would like to contribute, say that I contributed to the logo because I used to eat Fruit Loops all the time. They've got this little bird, this Toucan Sam, with a propeller for the feet. Um, so I don't know how much of that it was my doing, but you know that's what I like to think because I was a little kid. But so yeah, my dad was a, a huge influence to my my flying in life, and um, I got to do a lot of crazy things when it comes to flying. Um, I don't know if my dad would remember this or not, but I remember being at Sun and Fun in the late 90s and uh, my dad's had his Freebird there and uh, it grabbed a lot of attention because it was a unique ultralight. Um, it was kind of a lot like the Challenger except for side by side instead of tandem. But he, um, I remember him pointing out a Challenger saying, I don't remember if he said that's like a rich person ultralight or that's actually an airplane, but I kind of remember looking at it and seeing Challenger and thinking, huh, I wonder... I wonder what he means by that. But now that I've gotten older, I kind of realize that uh, um, it doesn't really fit in the ultralight category because of its weight. Um, and it does have, it is a little more like an airplane. It's, you know, it's an it's a light sport aircraft. It's an experimental, it's in between the two. So, um, so it's unique that way. Um, and because it falls in that category, it doesn't require the annual and the inspection that quite a regular, like uh, a Cessna or something would, would uh, require. And because of that, it has, it comes with its inherent dangers. Um, it's, uh, uh, I don't want to say dangers, but you have to be a good stick and rudder pilot to fly a Challenger. Um, I saw Courtney uh, put a video out the other day about why she's moving the stick so much and stuff when she's landing. The bottom line is you have to. You have to actually fly these planes. When I get in the 172, I get really bored really quickly because there's not a lot to do. I fly around and whatever. And obviously you're paying attention to things and you're you're monitoring things. But with the Challenger, there's a lot more things that are in play that aren't in play in the 172 or any, any uh, regular airplane like that. And um, as a Challenger owner, I've taken, I've accepted that responsibility and I understand that that is uh, part of it. That's part of owning the Challenger. Um, but you'll find with Challengers that they have a lot of owners. And I personally think, and this isn't out of uh, knowing, but I personally believe that pilots buy Challengers thinking, you know, it's just a good time and they are a good time when you, when you understand them and respect them. Um, but they realize right away that they can't fly them. Um, just because it requires a lot. How how you don't have to be a pilot to fly this, I don't know. I mean, you do have to be this, but like uh, this used to be an ultralight. So you used to not have to have a, a, a pilot's license to fly this. By the way, I am a private pilot. I have lots of flight experience. I have flown airplanes from this 
all the way up to a Cessna Grand Caravan at 208. Um, I have a lot of time in that, a couple hundred hours um, in, in the caravan alone. So um, I have a lot of flight experience. I grew up flying in these things. Um, uh, grew up with the Quicksilvers, you know, the like I was saying how Courtney's talking about flying the plane that way and stuff. You have to. You have to fly this plane. This plane's not going to fly itself. You let go of the stick, it's going to go somewhere else. Um, but anyways, rolling it back. Um, this airplane requires a healthy amount of understanding and respect. Um, and I think people buy them and they don't realize that and they get scared right away. And I'm not going to lie to you. It is. It can be scary. You take off and you realize a Challenger only likes to point its nose into the wind. So if you have five to ten crosswind and you take off, the plane is going to instantly uh, crab into the wind. Um, and you could try to offset that a little bit, but as soon as you do, you're, you're going to start flying the opposite direction, kind of. Um, this airplane has huge, I mean, it'll get hit by the wind and the wing will just go right over. And you have to be able to make a large adjustment and then be able to meet that adjustment in the middle after the fact. Um, so it requires a lot. This requires a pilot, a person to fly it. Um, there's no buttons in here to take it over. Um, you know, in your regular flight training, if if some of you are actually private pilots like I am, obviously one I, one thing I remember my instructor saying is don't death grip, don't death grip the yoke. You know, um, well you're death gripping in here because you have to. Every little movement is really important. Um, I also so like if you're gonna buy a Challenger, you should really do a lot of research. Um, I would not go into it blindly. I would find somebody with a Challenger, talk to them, have them show you things about the Challenger, have them take you on a flight. Um, it is a great, they are awesome airplanes. I plan on having one, you know, forever. Um, I do wish I lived somewhere more like the Midwest or somewhere where there was like a lot more open. Um, if you've seen my old videos just the last month, you'll see my engine, I lost my engine in the pattern here. There's nothing but trees here. Uh, there was a field behind me, but um, luckily I was able to make it back to the airport. But um, if I live somewhere like, you know, Kansas or something, I would n literally never worry about the engine because then whatever, you just land. Um, but here in East Texas, there are trees. It's more dangerous. There's a few other people I watch, like the main pilot or M, M Matt um, or my buddy Jason uh, over at Cotton Patch. These guys live in just heavily treated areas like I do. And uh, it's different for us. We have a different element of danger in our flying. Um, and it's a calculated risk, you know, you have to, you have to weigh the good, the, the good with the bad, basically, you have to say, well, hey, you know, I know the wind's coming from this direction, I want to land into the wind, um, or, you know, doing a really good pre-flight. Obviously, this airplane was not built in a factory. Challenger didn't open a big factory and then start making airplanes. Uh, this airplane was a kit plane. Uh, I don't know the guy who built this airplane. Um, for all I know, he did it high or drunk. I, I have no idea. I'm not saying he did, but um, we just don't know. Um, now this airplane is, you know, short of 300 hours, so I know it's been in the sky a lot. And the best thing I can do is depend on myself to do a really good pre-flight. Um, and I've gone through it. Um, I'll make a guilty admission, and uh, I, I don't know enough about the engines, the Rotaxes. Even though I literally grew up listening to Rotax scream on the back of Quicksilvers and Freebirds and stuff, um, I, I just don't know enough. I've been watching a lot of videos on YouTube, and I am a pretty mechanical person, but I've kind of intentionally avoided this because I was like, hey, you know, if I just have one, I'll have it worked on. Well, the reality is, is, is it's a little bit more temperamental um, and you have to know a lot about it. So I'm learning. I'm trying to learn. I'm trying to absorb as much as I can. Um, and so my suggestion to you, if you're buying a Challenger is, um, no, let me give you an analogy. Owning a Challenger, and I'm just spitballing this, by the way, I just thinking about it, but Owning a Challenger is a lot like owning a pit bull. I love pit bulls. I love dogs. I'm not. This is not an anti pit bull thing. Um, when you're walking your dog and you see a pit bull, you 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 kind of if it's not on a leash, you kind of do think to yourself, uh, it is a a good possibility that that dog is somewhat unpredictable. So I'm going to use a little bit more caution with my dog or my 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 kids or something. Um, and I'm not saying that I would just let them go up to any dog and pet them. I'm saying there's just a certain amount of awareness that you have as a human with a pit bull. I love them. I love pit bulls. We have a pit bull right now. It's great. Um, but you just have to be more aware. Well, here's the pit bull of the sky. 
You just have to be more aware. You have to be on top of it. You have to be willing to, you know, sometimes slam into the ground on your landing, um, you know, just to get down or uh, uh, you have to be, you're going to get beat up in turbulence. And also with the challengers lately, there's a big argument about some of the brackets and stuff that are on these airplanes, the, the Roni bracket, um, which I'll show you here in a minute. Um, there's a lot of debate about these things. And, and unfortunately, when it comes to the internet, we all have access to it and we all see all that. The wind's blowing the door, sorry. And there are so many keyboard warriors. It's funny, I think there's like 4,000 challengers in the world, but there's like 15,000 people on these challenger forums and they all have an opinion. It's like, now it's possible all 15,000 of them owned them because uh, realistically, you know, I think I'm the third or fourth owner on this plane and I'll see a challenger for sale in one place and then a couple months later, that same challenger will be sale in another place because what's happening is pilots are buying them and realizing they can't fly them or it's just not for them because it does require, in my personal opinion, I'm not saying, oh, I'm some great pilot, but in my personal opinion, it makes you a better pilot to fly a challenger. Um, and if you are a pilot who just skated by and just barely got your check ride done and all that stuff, no, don't go buy a challenger. You can't fly it. You need to, I mean, you can get there uh, and you definitely want to get an instructor and, and do the whole shabam. Uh, I went into this, there's no other challenger person around me um, uh, that I know of. I'm sure there is, but I just don't know any. So I kind of went into this blind. Um, I asked a few instructors and nobody wanted to take it on because they didn't have any challenger time. Um, so I just said to myself, hey, you know what? Uh, I can hear my dad's voice when I'm flying the plane, just like when I'd fly the Quicksilver. You know, if something happens, you know, let's uh, in the Quicksilver, you kind of get the nose down more. In the Challenger, you actually, as you can see from my one video, you have more of a glide ratio. Um, it's 11 to 1. So, uh, yeah, um, I got sidetracked there. Sorry, I keep on hearing things outside, but... Uh, um, so yeah, there's just an inherent respect that you have to have for Challenger. And um, if you're looking to purchase one, talk to the people who know a lot about Challengers. Um, and don't listen to what you hear on the internet, you know. Um, everybody's got their their two cents to put into. And all that matters is is if you have a Challenger and, you, and you're putting your two cents in and you're proving it and you're showing, you know, there's videos of you flying it and doing all this stuff and putting your money where your mouth is, then I, I wanna hear what you have to say because I, I trust that, you know, but these keyboard warriors are just, it's ridiculous. And especially in, for some reason, the challenger world. Now the groups I'm part of are awesome. These guys are, I mean, I can rattle off like 10 names right now that um, I just highly respect when it comes to challengers. Um, and uh, uh, I, I it, the, the, getting back to the safety, when it comes to names, I'm thinking about parts or ordering parts, but um, in regards to safety, there are a few things about these airplanes where they have had issues where brackets are broken and they've had accidents. And again, that goes right back to the, the pit bull analogy. You just have to be, when I fly this airplane, I know that I'm taking a risk that maybe, um, you know, somebody in a 172 is probably not taking. Um, and that's just kind of one of them. Um, like for the, the brackets that I was telling you about, uh, my airplane has the U-Fly stainless steel brackets um, that uh, the previous owner had put on there along with the heavy lift kit. But, uh, but there's still a lot to, th to think about when you're flying these planes, like uh, nuts and bolts. You have to, when you fly a Challenger or most ultralights, but you know, when I'm flying my Challenger, it is in the back of my head that there are a ton of nuts and bolts that I'm risking my life with. Um, you just have to hope that they're not gonna break or the bracket's not gonna break. And that is a, uh, a seed that's planted in your head. Now, am I scared of my Challenger? No, I'm not scared of my Challenger. Um, do I have a healthy understanding that the Challenger can be dangerous? Yes. And I guess, does that give me a little element of fear? It, you know, it does a little bit, but as long as you're, you know, doing really good pre-flights and you're paying attention and not overloading the plane with, you know, G's or um, weight, you know, um, then you're gonna be you're gonna be all right, you know. I think I've only heard of two or three accidents where brackets have broken. Um, uh, one of them, I know for a fact, there was two of them that were fatal. But uh, I will say, 
uh, and you challenger guys don't come after me please but obviously the average age of challenger ownership is a lot older um, I would say if I took every challenger person and I took their average age my assumption it would probably be like in the 60s maybe high 50s which isn't old but I'm just saying there's a lot of old guys with challengers and um, you know if they were to have an accident where they're hitting trees and stuff like that there's obviously a little less likely chance that they're gonna survive that um, but uh, but anyways um, if you're gonna buy a challenger do the research go find somebody that has one don't just buy this thinking you're buying some cruiser and you're gonna have fun and you're gonna put your family in the back and high-five them and you guys are gonna go and have a romantic uh, picnic at the beach uh, because that's not exactly what this plane's all about you know can that happen yes it can with a lot of experience and respect um, is it gonna happen right away no um, you know you have to you have to understand this plane so so please if you're gonna buy a challenger do research ask people get on the forums but don't listen to everything um, I know that sounds kind of like it's a contradiction but um, but anyways I'm going to show you guys a few of the brackets the, that I was talking about here and things that I worry about and uh, when it comes to everything else I I don't if you have any questions put them in down in the um, comment section of this video um, I just don't really know how else to explain it but I when I was buying and I hate to backtrack here but when I went to go buy my challenger I was looking for videos like this one that you're watching right now somewhere where somebody was just like hey just so you know this is what you should be aware of or um, this is the experience you're gonna have um, so I hope that somebody watches this video um, and maybe it helps them make an informed decision on a challenger also, there are situations like the Challenger that comes with long wings and short clipped wings. And um, so, you know, there are certain variables that are going to change with different Challengers. Um, some Challengers have fabric wings like mine, and some of them have like the slip cover. Good Lord. And um, it might be too windy to fly today. So, um, uh, so, you know, I personally, and again, here's just, this is just, spitball in here but I think airplanes with the fabric probably glide better than the airplanes with the slip cover um, you know the fabric is it kind of flexes into the wing and it kind of gives you more of like a lift in my opinion I, again that might be wrong this is just my opinion um, but there's a lot of factors you know so when you're buying a challenger you should definitely get with somebody who knows them very well um, I like to think of myself as caught up on challenger stuff but I am in no way shape or form or no way shape or form an expert um, if somebody said hey come with me to buy this challenger I would gladly do that um, but I could only you know tell you from my experience you know uh, what I think of the challenger um, and like I had said earlier my guilty admission is I just don't know enough about the 503 um, or the Rotax at all um, and again you know for you who don't know obviously this is a two-stroke engine you put oil in your fuel like you do your weed eater um, and uh, uh, you fly it like that. Some of them have oil pumps, pumps oil into the fuel while it's flying, but uh, for the most part, they're pre-mixed. Um, you know, my hangar mate, uh, Ray, has this Kit Fox, and he has a 582 in it, so it's like the big brother to the 503, and uh, he's more up on, on the Rotax, uh, or the engine stuff, than I am, but uh, I do plan on getting really involved in it and really figuring it out and if you're gonna buy a challenger or any airplane with a road tax you should do the same thing so anyways if anybody has any questions feel free to leave them down in the comments and I'm gonna shut up now and show you guys what I was talking about on the plane all right so for starters this is gonna be a long video and I apologize but the brackets I'm talking about are these bad boys um, so when these first came out, these were aluminum, I believe they're called Roni brackets. And a problem was people were over tightening these bolts. And what was happening was it was causing a stress fracture in here. And what, and then when the stress, fra stress fracture is there, then obviously without this strut, then the wing, it doesn't stay on the airplane. So unfortunately this exact piece on a few airplanes has come off and has caused accidents. These are the U-Fly stainless steel um, brackets. Also, there's a lot of controversy about like tightening them, but you're not really supposed to tighten them. You just put them on to where if I actually went and took the weight off the wing, you would see that this bolt would go, you know, it would spin. 
Uh, you don't want to pinch this because when you pinch this, obviously you take away from the structural integrity of the inside of the bracket. Um, now on the wing, there's four, or on the fuselage, there's four of those that go out to the wing. Um, and then on top of this here, or this is the heavy lift kit. Um, it used to just be this bolt straight through this pipe, straight to this. But obviously now they have that in that angle to where it uh, distributes the weight differently than it used to. Hence making it a lot safer. You see the one back there. So there are four of those. Um, and then, you know, obviously I don't think these classify um, as the same because these are like just pieces. There's no stress fracture. There's really nowhere for these to break up here. Um, because I mean, there is, don't get me wrong. Anything can break, but this is, this appears to me to be a flat piece and this is a flat piece. Um, and you can see they're bolted. So it's not like there is a unified piece like this to where that can crack. So my thought process is, you know, and you can see this one's got a little bit of play in it too. Um, not a lot. This one, these are tighter, but, uh, yeah. So that's a big concern with the challengers. Um, some of the other concerns with the Challenger for me personally, when I do my pre-flight, is I'm looking at all of these things. And I know if you haven't been a Challenger person or haven't dealt with them at all and you're looking at this, you're probably going, what in the heck are you dealing with here? But basically, this is just all that's got that's attaching all these uh, control surfaces, you know. And when I do a pre-flight, I'm looking at every little pin, uh, every wire, um, every, um, you know, pipe or uh, clamp. Every little rivet that's in there, everything. Um, another issue with some challengers that this this extra kit was put in, and because these this is what's holding the front main gear to the actual airplane. And what happened was this bracket was breaking, so now they sell this this kit that goes back and reinforces it. Luckily, that's on here. Um, my plate is not decked out compared to some. I have. The third door, which is a huge benefit, you know, especially being a bigger guy, I can get in there a lot easier. Um, and I have the Roni bracket or the uh, the U fly brackets with the heavy lift kit. Other than that, there's really nothing else done to mine. Um, when I do my pre flight, I'm also checking the tension. You have a little bit of looseness here, which is what you want. I'm checking every little thing. You know, when you pre flight a 172, obviously you can. You can you you're 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 just a specific too, but the 172 is not depending on nuts and bolts. It's not depending on these uh, piano hinges, you know. Uh, I mean, look at every little nut and bolt. You know, when I'm doing my pre-flight, every nut and bolt is assessed and touched. I'm I'm a big toucher when it comes to uh, the airplane. I like to grab everything. And kind of manipulate it and see if it's loose or if there's any wearing uh, or any type of structural damage. I know these aren't the brackets that are in uh, the controversy, but I always look at all this stuff because it's very important. All these things are, you know, they're important. So there's little uh, uh, bolts with nuts. This is what's controlling the elevator. And on the Challenger, they're actually individual. So there's two of them. It's not like it's one piece that's controlling the elevator. It's actually two separate pieces that are connected from this bolt. And, you know, obviously there's a thing in here that, that pushes it up and down. So, um, you know, there's like these little pins in here. These are all riveted on. When I'm pre-flighting, I am trying to break all these off. Um, even the trim tabs, I'm just grabbing them, making sure that they're still good. I'm looking at all of the these little pins, um, the nuts and bolts, the screws. I guess this is kind of like a just a, a Phillips bolt with some nuts on it. I'm checking these brackets. I'm checking all of this stuff, everything. Um, it's very important that I know that this airplane is ready to go when I'm about to go fly because my life depends on it, as odd as that sounds. Um, then after that, I usually float over here and I'll start with my prop, make sure all my safety wires in place, kind of grab it, make sure it's good to go check for any dings, which this one does have a few nicks in it. Um, uh, my belt, I, I have the GT2. I know it's the older one. I'm gonna get the newer one um, soon. This one seems to be in pretty good shape. Um, I check all the, 
the fuel lines now. Um, I, I'm a little more specific about it now, obviously, that I had the engine out. My fuel filter, oddly enough, is half full, which is good. Um, it was completely full when I was running the fuel pump all the time. It would just sit there full. But I check all these lines, kind of check everything here. I go to the other side. I check the, uh, you know, the EGTs and the CHT, the everything's tight over there and then for me because it's structural the most important things i check here is i get up under here and i check all these engine these uh the actual bolts that connect the engine to this mount but and then even more detail i go through here and i check if you can see back there but i check to make sure the bolts from the actual airplane are connected to the engine and all that good stuff and then I work my way over to this wing and I do the same thing. Um, I actually do it a little more specific than what I'm showing you guys right now. Um, you know, but I just go through, I check the brackets, make sure the brackets are good to go. Um, check them on the inside make sure you can see some threads on the inside. Uh, I check the back seat uh, stick and all of it. It's not that I use it, but I just don't want anything to come loose while I'm flying. Check these bolts that go out to the strut, to these gear struts. Um, yeah, so anyways, guys, I hope if you're watching this video, I hope you caught some benefit in it. If not, I apologize. Uh, I'm doing my best here to create content for you guys. Let me see here. Hold on. Um, you know, my plan, my channel is called Aviation Adventure Boys, but honestly, um, it's probably going to be a while before you see my boys in this plane. Not that I don't trust it. I just want to know it better than anything I've ever uh, known in my life before I put my boys or any other passenger in it. Unless it's just right here at the airport, I'll, I'll probably take people in the pattern. Not really an issue. We could just land if there's an issue. Um, but when it comes to trip adventures, I think it's going to be limited to the 172 for now. Um, I do have a video idea that my son has that there's actually a disc golf course at an airport nearby. So we're going to take the 172 over to that. So that's an adventure and it's in an airplane. So anyways, guys, if you haven't yet, leave your comments. Please follow me. Um, there will be a lot more Challenger and aviation stuff. Um, like, share if you can. Do all that stuff. Um, I hope nobody took offense to my video. I'm just trying to push my knowledge out to the best of my ability and hopefully make people more aware, help people with the process, make them understand why challengers are sold so often. You know, um, just again, trying to share the knowledge with everybody. So anyways, I appreciate you guys. Oh yeah, that's cool. Get a real airplane, buddy. A challenger. Unreal.